everyone. So we are starting uh, the ninth lecture of this causality series. Today we will cover three topics: the ID algorithm, uh, front door, back door adjustments, and uh, C components and how they are related. So over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's do some recap. Last lecture we actually saw the notion of an augmented graph. Right. So if you intervene on a set of variables, you just introduce a new node uh, and you just put uh, uh, directed arrows to wherever you are. Interviewing. It's a very simple operation. And uh, essentially you have two calculus rules. That simply says that uh, some D separation statement in the augmented graph implies invariances and conditional independence. The uh, one uh, okay, I can actually list the rules. So the first rule was um, if in G T bar, right? If you find uh, a deseparation statement involving three pairs of variables, right? This basically implies that the probability of x given y comma z in do p graph. Is nothing but the probability of x given z. This is just conditional. This is just uh, d separation in a graph where you did some surgery where you actually removed uh, arrows coming into t. It actually implies that some conditional independent statement holds within the intervention of the Yes. Now the other two are the more interesting ones. So one is called the do c condition. Right. You may not choose to call it Lucy, but it's OK. Uh, so what this says is that if a node um, F, uh, Fx is deseparated from Y, right? condition on X, uh, then uh, you can actually have it in GT bar if you want. Just to be more general, uh, this simply implies that the probability of y given 2x 2t is actually equal to the probability of y given x. So, I mean, if you want, you can actually add uh, extra conditioning sets, they just simply come over here. All I'm trying to do here is that I'm taking an interventional distribution. I'm just saying it's equal to condition. So I'm saying is that in GT bar, there is really no backdoor path between X and one. That's all this is. Okay. So I'm just stating the simpler version. There's a more general one where you can additionally condition on W and that will W will appear literally here. That's no, no, no change. Okay. Now, X is a set of nodes. Y is another set of nodes. Uh, and fx is basically a node which has uh, arrows into x. That's it. So this essentially implies that do x is same as condition. Sorry. Because uh, uh, conditional independent statements can be read this way, right? Like uh, you are already in GT bar, so you put a do t, right? And then you say that y given x doesn't change whether you are in the interventional or in the observation. And that's exactly what this is. Because in the interventional, when you do do, conditioning is, I mean, you usually put the x is equal to small x and do x is equal to the same x, something. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So you have to make sure that x is set to the same value in both places. OK, so you are saying y given small x is same as y given do x is equal to small x. Right, and have to do this. If you have one more conditioning, you just add one more conditioning over. There's no option. Okay, no that's a do c test. The convention is called do C because do is the same as thing. Yeah, do is same as C. Right. 
and uh, do do. I mean, like probably going for more uh, independencies, but here you only require the immediate uh, parents of them. So FX is that. Yes, yeah, FX is that. I mean, you just simply draw a node. So in GT bar, you take GT bar and you draw a node which has arrows only to X. Yeah. And if you find this D separation in that graph, yeah. then it immediately implies these two distributions hold if yeah. that was a CP. So that's all it is. It's a very powerful statement. Proving is not very hard, but the implications are pretty enormous. And we will see how these three rules slowly start giving rise to very complicated ID algorithms. Yes. And just for completion, what is uh, GT bar? Okay, GT bar is uh, in a graph G. So if you have node T or a subset of nodes T, if there are incoming arrows, remove all of them. So that is GT bar. So GT bar, remove incoming arrows. So let me write it on the left. This is pedantic. Do you see you are actually looking at the augmented? And yeah. See, I can write uh, a very similar statement without augmentation. Very messy. <laughs> uh, that's why I prefer the augmented version because the proof anyway goes through the augmented versions. As much simpler to understand. And uh, when we get to uh, causal discovery using interventional data, we will see that very analogous tests now start giving you information about the structure of the graph also. So it's all sort of uh, built together in some sense. So I wanted to introduce it this way so it's much easier. So whenever you want to conclude something, you let's say you have a test in mind, right? In the sense that you want to check if two sides are the same. Now, if you want to claim something like that, you know what is the thing that is required. You just try to see if that holds in the graph. If it doesn't hold, you can't say anything. That's all you do. Okay, now the third is the do do test. The do do test says that you can actually remove, uh, you know, a, a do intervention. There's no x here. So you have y given do x, do b equals y given do b, which means intervening on x doesn't have any effect on t. What that should mean is that from F, you should not be able to communicate with uh, the final Y at all, right? That's that's the only thing. That, so so the the, the deseparation statement is uh, FX, right? Uh, is deseparated from Y uh, given Z in GT bar. This I'm stating it a bit more generally. Uh, this implies that the probability of Y given you already have duty that's common everywhere. So let's condition on Z and then let's do on X and do on T. This is equal to the probability of Y given V. That's what this would be. Okay. Why is that? Uh, well, you're already in GT, so you have duty here. Now, what are you doing? You're saying that uh, y given z is invariant in both the observational and the uh, and, uh, and 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 the thing. So there's no conditioning on x over here. So all you have to do is in interventional distribution you check y given z. In the observational distribution you check y given z. They are supposed to be yes. That's it. It's very intuitive. You can just literally read from this. So the only difference between do c and do do is that uh, whenever you have a no node f node pointing to x, you also condition on x. When you do that, you actually don't go through any forward paths. You only go through back backdoor paths. So this basically says there's no confounding between X and Y. Right? This basically says there is no effect, right, from X to actually Y. So that's what this says. This basically says. Uh, so I missed a conditioning here. If you want, you can put another Z over here and add a Z over here. The only uh, change. All these statements are valid without X. Yes, all these statements are valid when uh, t is not low. Yes. Yes. I just stated it generally, but all these statements are valid without. That's like a successor to independence of like you are independent of x, which is dropping do x. Is that conditioning? Yeah, conditioning is dropped. Yeah, but yeah. this will test forward paths. Okay. 
uh, that thing will actually because why is that the case? If you have a graph, you can have some backdoor pass like this to white, right? Uh, forget about Z and Z is not very important. But you want to know that there's a direct path from X to Y. Only then there'll be any effect of changing X. There's at least one path like that for the effect to travel. So what you do is you actually just put FX because this is not conditioned. You can't go to back doors. You can only go through front front door. So you test whether this exists or not. Now exactly the opposite will be this stuff. Now you condition on X. So what happens is that you cannot go forward anymore because if you try to go here, this is condition. This is non collider. Sorry, this is a collider for this path, but non collider for this path. Right, so you don't go front, you only trace the backward path. And you're checking if there is a backward path. Or not. Right, so this is do C. This is do. I mean, you don't have to necessarily remember it with this mnemonic, but I just find it to be very simple to connect everything. Yes. Is it not just one looks very similar to three? One doesn't look very similar to three because here there is no. Uh, there is, there's, I mean, the statement is made within one distribution. In every other statement, there are two distributions. There is one interventional distribution where you intervene on both X and T. Here, you only intervene on T. Again, in this case, here you intervene on both X and T, and you intervene only on T. Right? So, this is invariances across distributions. This is conditional independency within a distribution. This follows simply from the fact that if you intervene on anything, it is still marked with respect to the original graph. Uh, and then uh, you can just uh, write the analogous uh, de separation statement with an extra thing that some edges are removed. So more independencies will hold, essentially. And, and uh, why does this simplify? You can just treat the surgical graph as the base graph and that's correct. Correct. That's, that's a basic. That's a basic. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just to understand uh, examples where FX might be independent of this? No, it's not independent here. It's just the separation. It's, it's just a topological thing. If you found, I, I will give you examples where uh, some of this holds, some of this doesn't hold. I will see what happens. But it's important to understand that the moment you read some connectivity, uh, some de separation thing, it immediately implies some two distributions have some invariance between them. It's very powerful story. What is this not checking back to us? It also includes switch. No, no, because from F we are traveling, right. not from X. Right. So if you want to go through backwards, this has to be conditioned. Because it's a collider. No, but there could be a confounder between FX and Y. No, F cannot never by definition F only has arrows outwards to X. That's the definition of that. Ah. That's the key. So that's why the augmentation has a okay. So this is a special status. Hmm? It, right? It's just that if you want to reason about some international distribution, uh, which is missing in the other thing, you just switch on and off, right? It's basically saying that X is left as is or X is intervened. If you want to state that, you just put a, an FX node, but everything will go outwards. There's no connection to anything. Else. Then, then, uh, how, how are we taking that? Here, no problem because. You want to go backward, so back door, so you condition on X. It's a conditioning on the same X, okay. FX and the same X. So what happens is you hit, you can't go forward anymore. Okay, so that is a collider. So exactly. It's a very simple trick. Nothing complicated. <laughs> and this trick has been used many, many times in many, many places to prove lots of things. It's very nice uh, in the sense that all the starting points are completely grafted in fact. Uh, I'll get even more data. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Okay. So uh, if we add, so in this case, FX only attacks on X. Yes. Uh, if we add. So uh, FX has to, I mean, see, FX is actually not a random variable. It's not good to think of it as a random variable. Whenever you want to prove a statement, you construct two distributions and you mix them using this F. It's like a meta variable. Right. So FX is uh, observational or interventional. If it's interventional, it will cut off all the all the things. It'll make a change because you can make a structural equation model change over here. Because I haven't specified what change. It can be any change, right? So this is a CBN. Yeah. Exactly. So what I'm saying is, imagine uh, I was considering non-atomic interventions, and I was considering the case where I'm intervening on the backdoor path as well. 
uh, then can. Huh, I mean, yes. when I say x, right, I actually meant a subset. I mean, you can have x to be a subset, and backdoor path is any path that has an arrow into it, and then it goes to y somehow. Right. When you say, um, when you don't condition on x, you can't go to any of these paths. So all backdoor paths are blocked. The only thing you can test is whether you can go front or not. Right. But if that exists, even the graph, then you know that that condition is going to so it's got nothing to do with x being atomic, but the figure that I drew, yes, it is atomic. Can we uh, address cases where uh, there's an arrow outwards from y? Yeah, you can have arrow outwards from y. Yeah. No, so for this backdoor part, mm -hmm. y back to x, but no, that's side. Yeah. So for example, right, I conditioned on z. So what you could have is you could have things like this. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, you could have some parts like this, for example, uh, where uh, you go to X and then you want to travel to Y, but conditioned on Z. OK. But then you actually are connecting uh, F to Y. So this conditional dependency is not actually true. Right? So this conditioning on Z is very important. OK, but the, the generic statement is that suppose you forget about Z, then it simply says there's no effect from X to Y. That's all it is. Yeah. But, but you could have some very weird cases like this is what I'm saying. In the case that you suggested, like you've just drawn. There's no, there's, by the way, there's no causal effect here. Yes. Fake. There is no cause effect, but condition on Z. It seems like when you cut off this edge versus you have this, there is a difference. That's all it is. Because the problem is X is actually connected to Y because of the conditioning in Z. There is no causal effect, but uh, the point is that you are intervening and then you are conditioned. When you intervene and then when you condition, sometimes the conditioning can create colliders. Okay. So this is not a general statement implying that there is no causal effect. What it means is if Z was null, then it immediately implies that there is no causal effect in that intervention. But you could have weird cases like this. But that's what it is. Right. And in this case, two of X is basically used to get opposite symbol. Yeah. It is not equal. Because it's connected. I can go from X here. And go here, condition on Z, collider, it opens and go Y. So there's no direct path. That is right, but doing X is won't have any impact on Y. Doing X will not have any impact on Y, but the problem here is you are conditioning on Z in both the places. Correct. Then these two distributions are different. Because I'm taking two distributions and I'm conditioning on some event. I can say the conditional distribution can remain the same. I mean, two distribution can be different. Conditioning on an event, they are they are the same. That I can always say, and that's all this is saying. You first, I mean, by the way, the, there is no counterfactual here. You always do the do. That's why I write it this way. You always uh, try to do the operations from the right onwards to left. You do all the do's first, and then you condition. Right. I am just saying when you do intervene, there is no effect true. But when you condition on that distribution, then you can create correlations between x and I am quite well captured in the moralization. Moralization, yeah. For example, if you have A, B, you have C, A does not have an effect on B. Sure. But then, no matter what you do to A, once you condition on C, A and B will be correlated. That's right. But to make it, so for this graph, for example, so conditioned on C, probability of B, right? That is equivalent to 2 of A conditioned on C, probability of B. Both are the same. Because like all that we are doing is conditioning on C and observing P. Uh, whether we are doing A or not, it has like no, no effect. Conditioning on A or No, or conditioned on C, A and B are like, so the maybe like do the modelization, right? If condition on C, then you have to connect A and B, and B right? It's now, even if you remove all, I mean, I'm looking at this B separation definition in the modelization. 
then A and B are connected. See the problem for A. Let me tell you what happens. You have P of B given C comma A. Uh, so right times P of C given A times P of A. You can always write it. Now we look at the right hand side. There's no do B here. Y given Z. Y is B. C is C. There's no A. But there's a marginalization going on with respect to A. So you sum over all A. But in the do, you set A to a specific number. Yes. Right? But then you don't have this term. So they are not equal. These are not equal, correct. But because like this statement is probability of A comma B comma C. Right? Correct. But yeah. what I'm saying is the whole joint distribution itself uh, has a change. When you marginalize also, they'll have a change. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, my only question is like, we are not conditioning on A here. Right? There's a condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are not conditioning on A here. But this do is set to one specific value. Why, why does it matter to B is all on this? Uh, it will matter to B because here B given C is getting marginalized with respect to A is what I'm saying. But here A has a specific that is only in the joint call between all three. Yeah, okay. So if you do do A here, it's as though you're setting A to be something. Right? So this distribution will take C given A, not P of C. So you are marginalizing here, you are marginalizing with respect to P of B given C. But here you are marginalizing with respect to P of B given C true, but C's distribution has changed. It is P of C given that that particular. Thanks, That's thanks. Yeah, subtle, but yes, <laughs> it's very strange that you actually don't have an effect, but you, but these two distributions are not equal because you can always intervene and create two different distributions. But I can have a common event where the the, the probability loses. That's all. It's a collider. It's an indirect collider. Right? Okay. Copy distance. Yes. Here, this is we cannot write like an X there, like in the sense that you know the do gets dropped. It's not a two step e e equality where Z given, uh, we are listing on Z, comma, X, comma, D. It's not that. In fact, it's just. Yeah. That, that, that was the question. That's also the question. I mean, I'm not conditioning on X, otherwise, I'll have an X over here. Yeah. Then what you say might be true. But then that will also be true because you'll avoid the forward path. There is no backward, so you can't communicate. Again, that will be true. But when you have forward, you'll be very careful about this. I mean, it might be a useless statement. You might never want to use this uh, when you're actually deriving any idea algorithm. But if this is true, then this is definitely true. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying it's a useful statement. Okay. So another important point I wanted to say is that if there is a deseparation that holds, if I remove an edge, the deseparation will still hold. Okay. Just removing an edge always helps you. OK, so whenever something holds uh, and you remove edges, it will definitely hold. So an invariance in a denser graph it definitely implies invariance in the sparser graph, essentially. So that's another important thing that I want to just point out. We'll often use this. We'll go to a denser graph, then make some statement and just remove some edges and say, ah, that holds there, so it must hold here. It's much easier to prove sometimes when you have extra edges. Right, so that's uh, that's another thing. OK, now let's actually get to front door and back door after at least uh, eight lectures. <laughs> uh, OK, this is one of the very important implications of Perlian theory uh, because it starts with knowledge of the causal graph where there are unobserved confounders, right? I only tell you where they are. I don't tell you any description about what they are. No joint distribution, nothing is known. Uh, and I just give you the graph. It's a different assumption than ignorability, uh, but sometimes it's not obvious whether an effect can be estimated or not. So these graphical criterions can actually give you sufficient conditions under which things are identifiable. So let's start with the simplest one, the do C. It immediately implies something remarkable. Let's call the backdoor adjustment. Okay, so let's go, go to that. Are these three rules complete in any sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I wrote all this. Uh, on the completeness of an ID algorithm for semi-Markovian models, December 2008, Huang and Valtorta. Go to this book. Sorry, go to this uh, like journal paper. Uh, they have a proof that says that three rules of do calculus is complete. It was known to be sound. I mean, whatever it gives is correct. But what is not known is that it was complete or not. But they actually show that it's complete. 
By the way, I'm not going to prove any completeness in this lecture because it's just a very complicated uh, uh, example that I have to construct. <laughs> uh, what I would do is I would actually tell you what the identification algorithm looks like. If it fails, assume that you cannot uh, answer that. And if you want to know why you cannot answer that, you can read uh, one of these uh, papers. So in a sense, what they're showing is that any other rules that are there are subsumed by these. Or can be derived from these three. Yeah, it just simply says there are two models uh, which are which which match in observational distribution, but then the interventional distributions are different. That's all there for that query. Right? That's what if you remember the ID problem I stated as the following. So what is the ID problem? Right? For all models M1 and M2, uh, for uh, a G comma P of three. So these are the two things that are known to you. The CBN with uh, bi-directed edges and P of V on the observable distance. This is the only thing that are given to you. If there are two models with latents and stuff that when marginalized over V gave rise to P of V and they do follow the same graph, which says it comes from the CBN, then whatever query that you have, uh, I'll just you denote it as Q, but the query could be some interventional query or some conditional interventional query. Uh, you know, Q M1 uh, must be equal to Q M2. So for all M1, M2 that are consistent with G and P of V, if the query that you care about are also equal, then it is identifiable. If there exists a pair where it's not equal, then it is not identifiable. So it turns out that the ID algorithm basically exploits the combinatorial structure and then it tries to give an identifiability formula. But at some point it will fail. And when it fails, we know of K exam, we can construct examples that is M1 and M2, which satisfies this, but then uh, the query is not the same. Okay. But I won't go into the counter examples. But because uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, like structure that is there for the ID algorithm that is that, that is finally proved to be complete. The ID algorithm was almost proposed by Tian and Pearl, at least for certain class of queries without conditional conditional distributions. You just want interventional distributions. It was known here already, but it was not known to be complete. What they proved is that that was complete and they extended it to conditional distributions also. So they had parallel results. Spitzer and Pearl proved it in 2006. Huang and Valtorta also had a paper simultaneously in 2006. Then they refined, and then these two are journal versions of those results. Okay, and uh, you can basically read these two if you want the complete picture. Uh, but I am going to focus more on uh, the paper that came three years before these results, uh, which is uh, by Tian and Pearl, and it's very beautiful. It actually talks about some very interesting ways in which you can factorize. Uh, the observed distribution, although there are bidirected. If you remember, we couldn't factorize. We had a marginalization over unobserved variables, and that was creating the problem, right? And it turns out there are very clever ways in which you can factorize at least somewhat, and that plays a very important role in the ID. Okay, but before we go into all of that, front door and back door, a direct application of these rules. Okay, is that fine? Actor, the simplest criterion. Okay, so you intervene always on T, and the outcome variable is Y. Okay, now Z is a backdoor, the subset of variables for the pair T comma Y. If Uh, T does not have any descendants in Z. First criteria, we take all paths that 
that are of the following form y okay i'm not specifying what happens here doesn't matter uh then z blocks all such these are directed parts yes we can have the uh, bidirected edge also. We can have you can have jumps like this. We have no idea. Take the CBN, just look at all paths, but the only see, for example, you will even start with a double arrow. It's not a problem. Okay, the only thing is it must have an arrow into D. That's the only that's the only thing. This is these are called backdoor paths. Okay, so the blocks all such paths. Then the probability of y given to t is given by the control I'm sure you guys must be very familiar at this point with this formula. This simply means this is something that you would get if z was ignorable, right? All this is saying is that z is ignorable. If you can find Z such that these two conditions are satisfied, then it is equal. So let's go back to the very first lecture where I started with pretreatment variables alone. Okay. So here we said that T does not have any descendants in Z. So T is the treatment. So Z, whatever variable I'm considering, is not anyway uh, going to be a descendant of T. So let me forget about all that that happens in between. Right. So there are some, so there's some T. If I have a bunch of parts, you get Y. And uh, Z is somewhere here. And essentially, it basically blocks all such paths. Right? You can't go uh, add to Y because Z condition not be Z D, D separates all. So there's no D separation statement here, as far as I have said. It just simply says that some paths are blocked by Z. Okay? Yeah. So uh, if both the criteria are applied, only then it's a backdoor. Ah, yes. Is it and or not? And this is a definition. Z is a backdoor if plan goes true. And then if you find a Z, then this implies then the intervention is there. Okay. Okay. Proof very simple. A direct application of uh, the 2C test. Okay. Convince yourself that if Z is a backdoor. D is a backdoor. Then Ft is D separated from Y given T uh, comma Z. So what I do is I put Ft, a condition on T. So I create a collider here. So you can't go front. You can go only back. You can only choose backdoor paths. So that's precisely the second definition. And T does not have any descendants in Z anyway. Uh, so that is something that needs to be ensured. Uh, then what happens is that uh, you keep following it backwards uh, and then you reach a Z uh, and it blocks all such paths to Y. But because you start only with such paths and all such paths are blocked by a Z like this, this is true. Okay. This implies that uh, the probability of Y given uh do t comma z is equal to probability of y given t comma z so i stated the do c test without the z i said you can always generalize it with z and uh, so you just put the conditioning over here so this is what it is okay so I still not proved what i wanted to prove it's just a one it's just a matter of uh, marginalization right so now you, what do you want? You actually want probability of y given to t. This is a distribution, right? And I'm looking at a marginal, uh, a marginal probability of y in this distribution. So it follows all, uh, all, uh, you know, laws of probability, right? So just lo look at the conditioning law. So which is you condition on z. But you have to also marginalize with respect to Z in this distribution. Okay. Now, T does not have a, any descendant in Z. By that definition, uh, P of Z given to T is equal to P of Z. 
I mean, if you want, you can write one more uh, do do statement and then prove this, but it's just a very trivial thing. If there's no pass from T to Z, if you intervene on T, it won't affect Z at all, right? So you use that. So this is just P of Z. This uses condition A in the definition. Yeah, condition A in the definition. Here now we proved that uh, Z block blocks all uh, backdoors on the do C test. This conditional distribution, which is exactly this, right, is uh, equal to just the conditional distribution of y given t to this, right? So you have probability of y given t, right? Yeah. So some uh, definition of uh, backdoor, which is just a, a combinatorial statement about the graph by the do see tests. And some small application of do do test basically gives rise to the control formula. This is like the simplest implication that you can derive. Something that is not very easy to derive, let's say, from potential outcomes or anything. So this is telling you when you can expect Z to satisfy ignorability. By the way, this immediately implies that uh, ignorability is also true. It's possible to show, but I'm not showing all of that here. It show that also. Basically, this implies this is basically a statement about ignorance. Yeah. Any questions? So you're going in two steps. First, you are uh, separating. Uh, the okay, conditionally, the, the do you do do t, and then you condition on z. Then I'm saying the same as p of y given t comma z. So you do, first doing do of t comma z. Ah. And no, then, do of uh, p comma z. Yes. Not do of t. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then uh, using the total probability exactly. in then, the interventional distribution. And then using the other uh, thing to say that do t is same as t condition. No, so do t does not have an effect on z. It's same as the observational distribution. Because if you do, if you're not a descendant, you can intervene, there's nothing that's gonna happen to you. That's no. Right? And therefore, uh, I mean if you want, you can write another uh, do do. Okay, there's a do do statement also you can write. Uh, you can basically say that Fz is uh, Ft is independent of Z. That's fine. Because there's no path from T to Z. So you go from F to T, you can only take backdoor paths. But if you want to take backdoor paths, you need a collider there and I haven't conditioned anything. Right? So Ft is just simply deseparated from Z. This immediately implies that P of Z you do do. Uh, condition P of Z given to P is equal to P of Z. Very simple. The simplest implication. So now let's go to another one, which is very, very. Power of this can now evaluate a distribution <coughs> in terms of uh, the of power. Now, the interesting thing is the more complicated ones involve several such steps of applying these do C and do one. There are many ways of doing it also. You can basically all you have to do is law of total probability in the appropriate way, and then you remove some do's, or you do you replace some do's by z's, uh, and then you do such manipulation. The thing is, there are many different ways of doing it. There's a huge branch of things which are doing it, right? You have to know whether you will ever end up with only observational quantities or not. That's the idea. So, so effectively, we are saying that, uh, or rather, can we say that all do distributions can be no 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 only if z satisfies if you can't find a backdoor path like that then you're then there's nothing i'm saying i mean i don't know what happens if you can find it this yeah. criterion gives you a way to work. so there's a general result that says that if the graph uh, does not have any descendant of t with the, except y like we accept the outcome then in some sense if you don't find a backdoor you can't find it there's something called generalized backdoor. I haven't talked talk, I haven't talked to you guys about that. But if you can't find some generalized backdoor, then you can't find the effect at all. And you have to do intervention distributions to, to do that. Only when on the pre-treatment variables are available. When post-treatment variables are available, what Pearl says is something very fascinating. So that's why we go next. That's called the front door adjustment. Okay. Wait, take, take questions the following kind. Right? So here the point is that you typically left this. Try to think of like for application, but what you would have is some outcome variable y in hand, some uh, interventional yeah. variable t in hand. The point would be to figure out what is a good z. Right. 
and algorithmically are these like it does seem like some but are optimization questions interesting like what is the smallest details? yes 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 so there's a lot of work on the smallest d that smallest d is one uh, the second other thing is that you want to find a Z that has a minimum variance when you actually try to minimize the thing. So it's a very fascinating fact that the smallest Z is not the one that you give the minimum variance. Because you would think intuitively that if you're regressing Y on a few variables, you will have less error. But turns out that that's not the best thing that you should do. So there's a very beautiful characterization, at least for linear models, there's a very beautiful characterization of what's the best Z that you should choose among many that would give you the least weights. So it is uh, a, a piece of work by Emma Petrovich. Uh, I just put it out because uh, I think Marlos Matthews was also involved in some of these works. Uh, but one of the main uh, interesting works uh, basically says that uh, if you care about uh, the least square error, suppose everything was linear, uh, so if you care about least squares error, the smallest z is not the best uh, thing that you do. In terms of there's some other z that gives you the least squares. It was a very surprising uh, yeah, Because each z has its own entropy. And it's own entropy. Um, yeah, it's a very complicated quantity. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, because finally what you want is the error in the estimate. And it turns out that it's not obvious how uh, uh, how you will pick the z. And they, they give an algorithm to pick the minimum z. So that gives the least value. And there are so many questions. See, this, if I give you the full G, I can certify a backdoor, I wish you're looking at it. But how much information do you need before actually you can locate a backdoor? So we have done some work on this. Very interestingly, you don't need the whole graph. Uh, for locating many, many backdoors, you actually need a single edge in the graph if there are no post-treatment variables. So there's a lot of work remaining to be done where you don't want to assume the whole graph, but you are you are given some side information about the graph. But can you actually do some tests to actually um, indicate that Z is actually a backdoor? So you want to move to the realm of testability, but you can't do it in general because uh, if you can look at backdoors by just looking at the data, then it obviates all Simpson's paradox and everything. That's not possible. You need some assumption. Uh, ignorability was one assumption that literally gives you this formula straight. There's nothing to assume there. Here, they say that if you know the exact uh, causal graph, not the exact mechanisms, just the graph, then I can locate such C. So the question, more important open questions are under what minimal conditions in which you can actually locate C. In general, the number of queries to identify such C would be exponential in the number of vertices. Correct, because you need to check for some kind of uh, like blocking criteria. You need to check this kind of stuff. By the way, uh, when I started with this, you can't test this from observational data. No, no deseparation statement include, I mean, involving F node can be tested with only one distribution. Because by definition, it involves two distributions. You can't hope to test something like this. Okay. So the graph is given, and that implies this. So there is a strong assumption over here. What I'm asking you is, if not everything is known about the graph, can you still certify that this is true? It could be possible. It turns out there are cases, very interesting cases, where it's certifiable. Okay, in fact, you can give complete statements. If so my thing cannot certify a backdoor, there's no backdoor of certain kinds. So you can say such statements actually. So, but there's a big open problem. Like, how do you actually do uh, such identifiability with minimal assumptions on the graph? So that I guess is where some interesting common metrics. Uh, So maybe I'll just state it as an open problem here in general. So how to certify Z? <coughs> Without knowing. Z full. So again, uh, Emma Perkovich et al. and Amin Jaber. Uh, uh, who's uh, with Elias's group? They both have done very great work. Again, solving a very interesting version of this problem. If you know only the Markov equivalence class of G, when can you say that a certain Z will be universally backdoor, no matter which graph you choose in the Markov equivalence class? 
So they have been able to identify conditions under which you can do that also. But those go into, you know, you have to study the Marco Equilibrium class and you have to figure out how one common set of Zs could be backdoor universally for all uh, graphs that exist in the Marco Equilibrium class. So that's a part of answer, but I'm asking a more general question. Without knowing G fully, doesn't imply that you only have the recent data, maybe you will have some side information. So then how can you actually? Any kind of questions are interesting here in the sense that I don't know G, they can stop it. Query like correlation between pairs or small. Yes. So, I mean, the simplest model is like I can query, like here's, here's the both computation. T is not given to me. If I can query a pair of nodes, and the response would be yeah. the edges here, like the cause effect. I guess. Yes. And then I want to, yeah. so naively it will be like n choose two is, but the point would be do it much better. But there are also hidden variables. Yeah. And you have to deal with all of that. Yes, that would be a very interesting question. In general, what would be some sort of a query comp? But you have to uh, define what query complexity you mean. Maybe you mean interventional queries, or you just simply mean that somebody is giving you some side information as such. Uh, so there's thinking of like the cause effect kind of stuff. Is, uh, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. In query to figure out x causes y, y causes it, but there's a yeah. I mean, you can now think of a universe of oracles you have, yeah. and you just apply it on G. I want to find what's the minimum query complexity before you can certify Z. I want to prove that whatever complexity you get is sort of optimal in either worst case or over an equivalence class. You start to, but these are very useful because now you are using the theory to go beyond saying that, oh, I need the whole G, right? Uh, but do calculus never says anything like this. It just simply says, the theory simply says that if Z is a backdoor, then all these are true. Nobody is saying that you need the graph, but only then you can get the backdoor. There are cases where you can certify a backdoor without knowing the full graph. That's what this says. Can you just say G to be all the other variables? No, it's not. Oh, the, all the non descendants of No, it's not. <laughs> That's the interesting part. So let me give you an example for that. Oh, so super states are. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the that is a non-triviality here. If you have there's a very beautiful graph called empires. So let's call it M. So this, this is a uh, bidirectional. So you, you are now familiar with bidirectional edges, right? So I'll just directly draw it. Right. M is a. Sorry, there are both are bidirectional. M is a non-descendant. Sorry, M is a non-descendant. M, so right. So M is observed. But if you condition on it, you will get it because this is not a backdoor. Because once you condition on it, you open the collider path. If you don't condition on anything, the null set is a backdoor. Okay, so that's why uh, Simpson's paradox is non-trivial because you need to throw out information. Ideas that, are that are causing the problem, and you could be introducing colliders if you keep. So that's the thing. If I give you more features, oh, I'll control for all of it. You give me ten, I'll control for ten. If I, if, I, if you give me twenty, I'll control for twenty. If you give me thirty, I'll control for thirty. That approach does not work because there are unobserved confounders. Whenever there is an externality that you do not know about, there's a reason why. Let's say I'm grading students here. Should I grade students based on the weather outside? I mean, it would be ridiculous to do that. Of course, it's an extra variable and it is a non descent, uh, right? But I shouldn't be doing it, which is very intuitive and obvious to me. But the fundamental reason why you shouldn't be doing it is because you shouldn't take some random correlated variable and that causes like collider bias. You shouldn't do that. Okay, so it is. it might be tempting to say that, okay, if I just take all non descendants that I observe, I will definitely get a back door and that's not. Uh, and there are uh, very interesting um, papers in Journal of Causal Inference. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so the, uh, the, the, there are two things that uh, that is a very direct implication of Perlian models. That's not very obvious from a potential outcome point of view. In potential outcome, the more pretreatment you get, the more you condition because they always assume ignorability. But the question really is, in practice, there are cases where you include more. You won't get ignorability, but you take a subset where you actually get ignorability. And there's a very beautiful construction by Pearl where uh, there's a very complicated graph where um, so every odd set you condition on is correct, and every even set you condition on is actually wrong. 
Okay, so there is a very complicated construction that you can have uh, where you keep, uh, you know, adding and subtracting things and you, you, you keep including some, you keep you exclude them. Whenever you have an even number of ones, then you are always wrong. If you have an odd number of ones, you are always right. So you can come up with uh, examples like that, basically. So Simpson's paradox is not at all trivial. I mean, this is at the heart of Simpson's paradox. We are just giving a sufficient condition when it's enough to control for this. But Z necessarily can be minimal. It doesn't have to be maximal at all with respect to the information that you have. Okay. So I want to yeah, completely miss this point. Here. Supersets of C might not be that good. Exactly. Very important. It should be the most important statement. Okay. Yeah, which, uh, so by the way, uh, in all of this, it's very important because the moment I draw an edge like here, like this, or an edge like this, then it's a different story. Either you are in the regime of complete non identifiability. Uh, or maybe if I reduce this edge, maybe M is still a good for, for example, this graph M is a good backdoor. It's true because there's no collider. So you are blocking the path backdoor path by using M. But the moment I put a bidirected edge, no. If both are present, then you can't estimate anyway, right? So, so the point is that the sparsity is very crucial. So some people who criticize say that, okay, all these fancy things happen, but happen in a world where things are sparse. But how do you know that things are sparse? So that's one like uh, uh, one, I mean, one, one criticism that you have. But if you are strongly believe that things are sparse, uh, then if you don't observe certain things, it's not true that you include all the features because that's a machine learning thing to do. You have more information, just include all of them and regress. But even the infinite samples are not going to save the world. Just to get this point a bit like more properly, so in this definition, when I take a superset of Z, which is, does not include, so let's say I start with Z and I grow it to Z prime. So Z prime is a superset, and I'm including non like non descendants of T. Then what part is breaking? Right? Like, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to like pinpoint. No, I just give you an example, right? That's a null set was, but uh, oh, you want? I mean, you can extend this example with uh, some other extra variables that you can see, and then uh, you can actually show that okay, you should not. Condition. So all you need is basically what can happen is you can have a collider by itself. So you have you first create a collider, then you create some other variable x, then you go to y maybe, and uh, you have some uh, yeah you have some variable like this for example. Uh, then uh, you should you should control for x, but you shouldn't be controlling for both essentially something like this. you should not control for m because you're just connecting unnecessarily. You should drop m if it's possible. So these kinds of examples can actually give you uh, a lot more mileage. But in addition, Z, like it's uh, yeah. So when you are adding vertices, V will not will always be satisfied. Okay, so let me give you one structure theorem. That's all that is possible. Okay. I'll give you one structure theorem. It's by a beautiful result by Van der Weyl. Maybe spelling the thing wrong. Uh, and Spitzer. That they prove if B is a backdoor and it exists, then observed parents of P union observed parents of Y is No. If you found a backdoor, it would be whatever set. Oh, okay. Observed parent of T, union observed parent of Y is also a backdoor necessarily. If you ever found a backdoor, this is definitely also a backdoor. Okay, so it's a very important structure result. It says that when you go from here, and if I block it, uh, and when you enter Y, if I block those, there's just no way in which your collider, you can do whatever collider bias you want. It's not going to actually cause a problem, provided you know that there exists one. It's not very easy to prove, I think, but uh, something good to meditate on. <laughs> so very important structure result that says that canonical backdoor. Canonical backdoor. So if you give me a, if you say there's a backdoor, I have a canonical backdoor. But it might or not always be possible to find out what the observed parents of T and observed parents of Y are. Obviously, 
it is complicated. But if you knew, then that's all you need. Observed parent of y would be descendant of t. Observed parent of y, no, in the okay, uh, but uh, excluding the descendant of t. Oh. I mean, I meant uh, you know, the, the ones that are parent y, but not descendant of. Of course, here you can have things, and that's a problem. You should never take this and so uh, right? So this was a very interesting uh, result. Um, but uh, you can actually read the paper to find. Uh, it's complicated. I don't know. It's not obvious to me <laughs> uh, because there could be all sorts of graphs. Uh, M by certainly satisfies this uh, criteria. It's null set. Nothing there. But that's the back door. But there is a back door. It's also null set. So there's only one back door there, but you can actually generalize. So there are lots of nice structures here. Also. Very nice way to say, like certify non existence of that, not of this. Huh, but how do you know not of? Because it's an unsupervised problem, right? All I'm doing is I'm asking a query. You can give whatever answer you want. Only if you have a way to validate it, you can say there's no that. No, no, I'm saying like, if I know the graph, for example. If you know the graph, that's true. I just look at the observed parents of t, observed parents of i, remove the parents of t. Okay, I think it's either or or, and I'm just being a little bit, uh, I don't know if it's a union or or. I would like you to verify, but uh, it's by Vanderbilt and Spitzer in 2008. I don't exactly recall the structure theorem, but it is something like, I think it's a union, but uh, yeah. Because if you block t, then. Uh, yeah, you can have double arrows and going up. Right. OK, so now. Um, OK, this was just a digression. Let's go to the another very important implication called the front door. I guess I won't reach the C components today. It's fine. The front door is a bit more complicated. Because it's a mouthful. But let me tell you what's the very important implication of front door. In potential outcomes, the general uh, um, description is take out all variables that are descendants of T. Take only pretreatment variables. And uh, whatever satisfies ignorability, use that to uh, control, which is same as somewhat like a backdoor state. Right? But what front door says is very interesting. So this is the graph. There are no pretreatment variables. So the prescription fails immediately, <laughs> right? But you can still identify the fact. But there's a mediator. But the mediator is not connected to Y. It turns out here in this graph using Z, you can actually identify the effect from Y to T. Not obvious because there's a direct confounder between Y. There's a common cause. <laughs> between T and Y. But the fact that the effect goes through only Z is the thing that I'm using to actually estimate the effect from T to Y. OK, but there's a more general prescription. This is the graph. This is a, uh, this is a simple graph, but there are three more general conditions. So here, so I initially said Z was, uh, T does not have any descendant in Z. This is literally the opposite condition. Z blocks all paths, all directed paths. From T to Y. Second condition. Okay, by the way, these conditions are not minimal. Uh, you can generalize this, but I'm just stating a very simple form, which is often quoted in front door edges. The other condition is um, all backdoor paths between Z and Y. Or, or pass through T, or can be blocked by T. It's much easier. Okay. T, T and Z 
don't have a bad dukkha. Oh yeah, I said a lot of things, <laughs> uh, but uh, this graph satisfies all of them. Uh, basically, the point is you want to find an intermediary such that the effect from T to Z can be estimated. So there is no backdoor path between T and Z, then it can be estimated, right? Then Z to Y, the only back, any backdoor path should go through T, or it should be blocked by T. So T is a backdoor for Z and Y. All backdoor paths basically go through T, which means it can be blocked by T also, because these are all directed. You take all the directed paths back, and then you can block T. So I just wrote it in very general, can be blocked by T, essentially, right? Uh, and then Z blocks all directed paths between T, because if there's a path that doesn't go through Z, then you can't do this trick, because it's some other path, and I have no idea how to control for it. Okay? Now, the main point is that this might be a mouthful, but the thing is, you only use post-treatment variables to control for a case when there is an absolute unobserved confounding between T and Y. Okay, this is an implication of the Perlian models. And now people have actually started looking at front door adjustments, approximate versions of it, and all that. And there's a lot of work going on. Actually. So you can ask, oh, what if any of those assumptions are only approximate? What can you say? Can you do sensitivity analysis? A lot of questions are very interesting. But the main point here is that if T affects Y through mostly a mediator, uh, and uh, if these conditions are and that's not uh, that's not correlated with the confounder between T and Y, then you can you can do this. Then what can you do? Then you can estimate the effect of T on Y. I haven't told you the formula. I have to write the formula. When there is no confounder between T and Y, then that's fine. Conditioning y given t is not. Then the same formula will be. That is also holds, but if you write it down, you don't need any complication. Just y given t is sufficient. Sure. But here y given t is not sufficient because of the confounding. So you need some complicated adjustment. Right? By the way, many of these adjustment formulas, there may be several ways of deriving them in the sense that when adjustment exists, there may be some other adjustment formula that gives rise to the same number. That's all you might because the scalar that you're estimating. Uh, right, so there may be multiple because do calculus is not a single thing. You can branch in two different ways and you can arrive at some observational distribution. They may look different, but they may actually evaluate to the same number. That also is possible. Okay, and we'll actually see like somewhat if I get to see component factorization, like one other formula that actually solves all these problems in one shot. But uh, let me get to that later. Uh, yes. So, my understanding of these formulas, uh, y, the u to y can be a double edged end. Spider. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't like this, uh, all I mean is see in physical systems there may be cases where, for example, right, there's some complicated externality that actually controls the outcome and the treatment. But you come into some digital system and you can follow through everything from the treatment, and that has got nothing to do with an externality. If you have a system like this. Uh, you need to use post treatment variables, and you can use them to actually get rid of conformity. In my opinion, it's a very powerful statement. Very, I mean, it just comes through some do calculus rules, but the moment you look at the implication, they're pretty enormous. I mean, the only question you might have is how are you so sure that whatever externality? Does not directly affect Z. Sure, it could. Not saying that it won't. For example, if you put an arrow here, uh, essentially T and Z don't have a backdoor path breaks, right? Because you have a confounder and then you go to Z, and I can't condition on anything. Therefore, there is a backdoor path, so it breaks. Uh, like uh, three. Two also. Yeah, two also might break uh, because there is a backdoor yes backdoor path through something else. So that also could break. So yes, there are ways in which you can break. Again, sparsity of a specific kind gives rise to some very, 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 very important results. Right? Let's just see how um, the do calculus rules uh, help in deriving the formula. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me just look at it once so that I don't make a mistake <laughs> because it involves like two, three steps. Maybe take more technical questions, but. Uh... The way I'm 
can you see is that these are sort of very graph related conditions that lead you to very interesting yeah. connection between so human. We will go to the graph theoretic algorithm that lead to all okay. uh, identified results. That's the promise. Is there like a subgraph uh, uh, version of looking at it in the sense that so this is quite revealing the figure that you drew. Uh, so my question is, I, I, I mean, instead of testing these three conditions, are there like, like instead of do calculus, are there graph theoretic calculus? Where, uh, yes, the, the C component stuff will get to that. Okay. You, you make it completely graph theoretic. Okay. okay. It's just an algorithm that just takes the graph and just keeps computing. And finally, if it fails, it fails. If it passes, it passes. And it give you a giant formula. And there is a very nice generalization of backdoor and frontal. We'll come to that. But uh, but for now, we'll just have this. Okay. Clear or not clear? Yes. Good. Okay. So let's start with our favorite formula P of Y given to P is. You marginalize a law of total probability applied to the intervention. Okay, so first of all, T and Z don't have a backdoor path. Right, so there's nothing to block. So therefore, P of Z given T is same as P of Z uh, do. There's no backdoor path. If there's no backdoor path, what it means is that FT uh, is D separated from Z given T. This is what 3 implies. If you do a 2C test on that, uh, so I just write it. In fact, that box thing is an equivalent definition of that. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, correct. So this is nothing but P of D. D and this is from the third box. From here, it implies this, it literally implies this. Okay. T and Z don't have a backdoor okay. part, implies this, and this. Okay, we got rid of one do here, right? Now you want to get rid of this do T, but unfortunately, it's not so simple. So what you do is you actually introduce a do on Z also, and then you remove do T. Okay, so it has some non-trivial ways of going, the paths go non-trivially. So the next uh, thing is, see, it might all seem like magic because I know how it goes, right? <laughs> but uh, but there is an algorithm which you can, uh, algorithmically you can do systematically all of this, and there are better identifiability conditions. We will come to that. Once we get to C components and all that, we will come to that. A generalization. Okay, so let's take P of Y given Z comma do T. My claim is that I'm going to reduce this to the observational case. So the first argument is that this is nothing but P of T given do Z do T. Okay, what am I using here? All backdoor paths between Z and Y pass through T. Okay, I did do T here. I already removed all the incoming edges to T. So you can go till T, but you can never reach Y anymore. Therefore, uh, the backdoor, the do C thing holds. So here, F uh, Z is D separated from Y given Z in G T bar. Okay, I remove all the incoming edges to T. Uh, so all that matters is all the backdoor paths uh, pass through T. This is all I need. And I remove all the incoming edges to T. So T is hanging, right? It has no connection. So you can come all the way to T, but you can't go and reach Y, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and the only way you can come from Z to T is because it blocks all the directed paths. You come through directed paths, essentially, right? Uh, so you have a backdoor path uh, from Z that originates from Z and it wants to connect to Y, but because uh, T's incoming arrows are removed, there is no way, uh, you know, there is no backdoor path anymore. So in G, T bar, there's no backdoor path. Yes. 
Sorry, sorry, P of Y here. So no back doors between Z and Y in G P bar. This is implied by two. Okay. So now what do I do? I get rid of uh, do Z do T. I get rid of uh, T. But that's very obvious. Why is that? T. I said all paths from T. Are intercepted by Z. If we intervene on both, it's equivalent to intervening on only the descendants. Right? So this is nothing but P of Y given to Z. Now, why is this true? This is because of one. I've used all these already. Okay, and I need to use this once more in P of Y given to Z. Right now, there is no so all backdoor paths are basically passing through T. So if I condition on if I condition T, then I mean if I block T, then there is no path going forward. Right. So that means P of Y given to Z for this T acts like a backdoor. Right. So you actually have the backdoor form. You you basically average over T P of Y given Z comma T times P of T. So this is the do. I am saying this is nothing but controlling for T or controlling for T. And that is P of P, P of Y given to Z. Now this term is nothing but this, but I'm averaging over all T. Right? And this T is T is equal to small t. There is a do T that I hate that I kept. So let me be very clear. This is uh, t is equal to small. Very important. Okay. So the final formula looks as follows: p of y given do t is equal to t is given by uh, you have a summation over t p of y given z comma t t of t. This is average over all t. What remains is y and z. Okay. So I need to average over that also. So you do over Z, P of Z comma T is equal to T. Here is where T is. Okay. Complex formula doesn't matter, but all that has happened is I try to estimate the effect from T to Z and then from Y to Z. That's it. I just multiplied in some form. That's all I effectively have done. And there are many ways to look at this formula. You can opt, you can just sort of like move around certain things and you can write it slightly differently. And that will motivate what is to come with C component. C components. Okay. Yes. Now let's get into. I mean, I was planning to actually <laughs> cover quite a lot of this, but let's get into one result from TR first. So these are sufficient conditions. So you might ask, okay, I can keep on giving you sufficient conditions. Okay, under some cra crazy criteria, and I can have. Some observational formula is there an end to it? So you need to you need to have some more general theory as to why this is even working, right? So let's start with one interesting condition. So this is clear, right? So it's a complete confounding. You use only post statement variables, and then I'm able to actually get uh, uh, identified. Yes. You've seen P of Z given to Z before, right? Yes. But uh, T might have a different. Uh, yeah, so here there's a marginalization over T, but this term is not marginalized. It's only conditioned with respect to that T on which you force. That's why I wrote it this way. If you want, uh, usually the way it is written is T prime, T prime, T prime. This is T. The marginalization is over T prime, the separate variable. Then you have this number. Then you multiply again by P of Z given T equals T, and that's what it is. T equals. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I, I, yeah, so you need the force, right? I mean, that's the, you want a treatment effect when T is set to T. Again, open questions. When can you certify front doors without knowing the graph? There's some work, and uh, more work needs to be done. What's the complete statements you can make when you don't know the full graph? There is a more there's a general version of this right again. So, for example, I said T and Z don't have a backdoor path. 
But let's say there is a backdoor that blocks all backdoor paths between T and Z. In the appropriate formula, you have to marginalize over that. So there is a generalization of this. You can call it as some generalized front door formula. And when is it true? Uh, like, do you need to know the whole graph? Turns out that there are some interesting conditional independencies you can test with some very little side information, and you can still write such formulas. So, yeah. And for, for causal discovery, learning the graph, using these statements equals equal to zero, and information about certain inventions. Can reverse it out, right? Uh, see, if you have a full stock statement like this, it implies. See, the thing is, um, in causal discovery, at least you need atomic statements of this form. This actually tells me something about the connectivity in the graph. Correct. But three such statements gave rise to this equality. But if you gave me only this, you need to have some argument to say that one or all of them are satisfied in general. Uh, then if you have such statements, then it implies and constrains the graph greatly. Yes, that's true. But multiple such equations. Yes, it could things. give rise to. Yes. It looks like that. Yeah, I have no idea. I have not seen any uh, buddy do something like that. Like you are saying that if I knew that such interventional effects are identifiable and that's all I, I know, and this is the formula, then from just that, can you tell me something about the graph? I'm sure something must be possible to say, but uh, the complication is that in order to get to this, there are several parts of do calculus. I could have used any one of them. All you can say is uh, one of the parts was right, but uh, I have no idea how you came to that. So maybe with C components, you can say something more clever. I believe that is true, uh, but I don't. I haven't seen anyone who actually does. But that's a good question. So now let's get to one more condition. So we enter Pian's uh, world. Very beautiful. <laughs> uh, so the chronological story is that uh, Gallus and Pearl, so Gallus was another, I think, probably a collaborator or student of Pearl. Uh, he actually derives more conditions that, are, that go beyond back door and front door. Uh, so what Tian basically said is like, OK, all these conditions are all uh, sort of subsumed in one single characterization, which is called the C-component factorization. We will come to that uh, and said that all these things that you have said so far can be captured by this one formula. It's a bit complicated, so we'll go slowly into it. Uh, and the intuition was that, um, OK, so what was the primary problem? Let's go back to the primary problem. So when you have a CBN, The issue was your P of V had factors. Uh, so I have uh, uh, VI in V, P of VI, given the parents of uh, VI, come out, but unfortunately, there were also some unobserved confounders. But then I had to marginalize over all of these things. There was no factorization that was there. Right? There was no causal factorization. That was that. These are causal bits, but the problem is they need to be averaged with respect to some unobserved variable. I have no idea what it is. Right? So what he and, uh, and Pearl finally found out was that uh, you can, so, so if you look at the graph, the SACBN with a semi-Markovian model, there are actually two graphs in it. Or rather, you can think of them as two graphs. So one is uh, the graph G, with only the directed edges. And the other thing is the same G with only the undirected. Okay. Well, I'm just taking the graph. It has bidirected edges and it has directed edges. I'm just saying look at two copies of the graph where you don't put bidirected edges, and the other one you basically put bidirected, only bidirected edges. Bidirected. Okay. Now, uh, you take the connected components of this graph. Okay. Let's call the, by the way, when I say connected components, connected components induce on B, the thing that you observe. Okay. So, they partition B into 
S1 union S2 into union SK. And uh, these are the connected components. In uh, G uh, with respect to two, the adjacent two. Okay. Now, there's a very beautiful result that says <coughs> that this crazy factorization can be factored over these factors. Okay. Why is that? Because what is the main problem here? If I want to pull this factor out, uh, because U is connected to something else, I have to pull that guy also out. That is connected to something else, I have to put that guy also out. Every every one, and then I have the average, and I have to take the identity separate. But if you actually have connected components, the U's don't talk with each other across these components. So the marginalization has to be done only within a component. So that is the first insight. Okay, it's a very simple insight. Uh, so from what I said, P of B, but just definition. Right. Uh, this is nothing but the product over all these SIs. Uh, what you now do is you do marginalization, but you do product over. Uh, sorry, so I meant uh, I meant to do the following. Is it equal to these components as a meta node? Yeah, 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 that's all I wanted. To, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So you do product over all these uh, components. So let me just do. Product over a site, uh, right? Uh, or let me just define one component. That's much better. So Q of S i is nothing but there is still averaging. Okay, you are not getting rid of this, but you can average only with respect to nodes in S i, and not, and why get about everything? Everything else. That's the only key thing. So now J belongs to S J, P of S i, P of B J. Given parents of BJ, come on, whatever uh, like confounder that it had. But we know for a fact that wherever it goes, it has to land up in SI only. Right? So these are taken together, they act like a component, and you're averaging with respect to only UJs over here. But you can average with respect to extra things, and it doesn't matter because they are disconnected. In. So I'm just writing it. If you, if you have a trouble with this, then I will just put. Only those uh, unobserved variables that are within this component. Okay, so if you uh, if you want uh, the clarity, you can have it. But you can always average with respect to some other independent variable. It doesn't just the same, right? So you average with respect to only the exogenous variables in your component, and then you take the product. Okay. So the claim is that P of V of this, right? P of this is what is P of what? That's, P of this, right? That's the definition. P of SI is this marginalized quantity. Oh, I'm not marginalizing with respect to everything here. Uh, all the products then marginalizing. I'm taking only some part of the products and then marginalizing only with respect to some subset of exogenous variables that are there in my uh, C component. By the way, this is called a C component. I'm going to use this term very frequently. So, just to be clear, the point is that we only look at. Uh, only the bidirectional edges, they form like connected components. What I'm saying is that the original factorization, yeah. where you couldn't pull factors out, yeah. you could actually pull factors corresponding to this big component. You probably couldn't go inside. We'll come to that. But as a component, you can actually factorize in this. So the main thing is P of V is nothing but the product over SI of Q of SI. If they have parents, they have parents. The parents could be outside, no problem. The parents might be in G1. Yes. Uh, I mean, imagine that you have a bidirectional edge like this. There's a parent. See, but this is P of V, right? Like what I'm trying to do here is I'm testing what is the joint probability. Of uh, so this is just a factor. I mean, I'm just defining a factor. I'm not defining anything else about this factor. This is with respect to V, right? I'm just saying this factor has all V's, sure, potentially. But all I'm trying to say is this can factorize this way, and P of V can be written as product of this. Factor. That's all I'm saying. The main problem previously was I could never pull the product outside, like in a CBN. Here I'm saying over C components you can pull them outside. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not claiming that there is no connection between one C component and another C component. 
There are no bi-direct connections, but there are direct connections. Sure, no problem. And that's okay. Yes. So S1 union, so until SK, might not contain all of them. What do you mean? Because G2 might be very sparse. G2 might be very sparse, but it's on the same set of nodes. So it okay. will undergo a partition. Because I take all connected forms. Okay. So partition. Isolated. Yeah, isolated, you just put isolated. Then you go back to the original class and ask the questions about parents. Yes, yes. You can't I'm drop that. <laughs> yeah, you can't drop that. They'll, be, they'll exist. Nothing you can do for. Okay, now the, another interesting, very fundamental insight, which for example, Saronan has used in many of his works, is that this Q of SI now looks like some marginalized quantity. Again, I don't know what, what to deal with them, but turns out each of this component is also an interventional quantity, which is Q of SI is nothing but intervening on everything except SI, but evaluating on S. Consistent with me. Intervening has to be consistent. So you take the V's that are outside, right? Intervene on all the nodes and set them to those V's. Okay. And then you actually look at the interventional distribution on this subset of nodes that you have in your C component. That interventional distribution is exactly identical to this. And by the way, there's no proof needed because when you intervene, you chop off. So in this, when you intervene, you chop off all the factors that you intervene. What we left is only the factors in SI. And everything else has been set to some constant, right? So this is exactly the interventional distribution by definition. It's just an observation. Observe two truncated factorization. So it's not exactly truncated factorization. There's a marginalization outside. But what I'm saying is, whenever you intervene on something, all the factors will get dropped. Whatever you intervene on. So what you do is take the C component, take everything else, intervene on everything else. Right, only the factors within this will remain, and when you average over P of U, it's equivalent to averaging only over P of U of SI because they are all independent, right? Because only those things matter, and you will exactly get this factor. And this is now, now a product of interventional distribution, right? So this is just from definition. So there's nothing complicated over here. Yes. So effectively, in graphs with no bidirectionality, mm -hmm. everything is a C component. Every node is a C component. And therefore, like you're saying that P of V is a product over. Huh, that is true, uh, right? Uh, because whenever you have to. So getting back to the results. Getting back the results of okay. okay. By the way, this does depend on the, the parents outside. But they have been set to some value, which is consistent with V. Don't think that it is independent of the parent. It is dependent on some parental value. But it has been set by an intervention. We don't have to worry about what others are doing. This this module is acting as its own. But the thing is, you can't intervene. In, you can't factorize this module even further because they are all confounded together. You can go from anything to any other thing using a sequence of bidirected paths. So conditioning and all that won't help in general. But that's the intuition. But uh, we are going to actually investigate what happens when you take subgraphs and take C components of subgraphs and all that. Only then you will go to more general results. Okay. Now there is one more important result. Uh, so I'll take five more minutes to prove. Uh, it's a very beautiful uh, induction result. Almost nothing happens, but then you get something very remarkable. So I think uh, you guys should. Uh, I think it's interesting. And it seems like if these C components are say small in cardinality, complexity of this marginalization is not that big. exact. So the C components are three, then essentially you have these components and uh, each of them are intervene interventional distributions also of everything else intervene and the product of interventional distribution is equal to the observation okay okay so far i have not said anything about whether any one of these interventional distributions are identifiable see i only said this is a product of a bunch of interventional distributions but that doesn't imply that any one of them is identifiable i haven't told you anything of that sort yet now, the other important theorem is that they are each identifiable. And uh, and I'll tell you, it's a very simple form. Yeah. But is this clear? Just pointing to. Yeah. 
we'll slowly uh, see why we are doing all of this. I mean, we are not doing this without any reason. We are doing it for a purpose. Okay, so Q of SI was PV of SI of S. What we said. This is just for observation. There's nothing not here. Now so the main theorem. So there are two parts to it, but I'll prove only one part. Uh, the other part I'll just leave it to you guys because it's just a desuperation state. <laughs> you can just see what a C component means. Just do the appropriate desuperation statement. It's very immediately obvious. Okay. So now the first part of the theorem is what is actually more interesting. Now the other claim is that Q of SI, each one of them is identified. The international distribution is by itself identified. It's not obvious because they have terms that connect to something else. So you have no idea. Right, but these each uh, interventional distribution is identifiable, and it's a very simple and explicit formula, which is uh, okay. So before I write the formula, sorry, I need to define something. So first, I'm going to explicitly give you the distribution. Right. So let's order these in terms of a topological order. The complete order, which is consistent with the causal graph. Because there can be many orders and I don't care. Right? So V1, V2, let's say Vn, uh, and this basically forms the set V. Now I'm changing notation a little bit. Right? How do you do the dilating? Just like the ordering, yeah, the ordering only uh, is about with respect to graph one. So okay. with respect to the observed. With respect to the observed. This is the only thing that matters. Now just define V of I to be everything until VI in the order. So V1, V2, but in the order. Okay, it's not just some random I way. So now the theorem is that Q of SI, which is actually an interventional quantity, uh, is nothing but the product over vi that belongs to si, so let's say vj that belongs to si, probability of vj conditioned on vj minus 1. Okay, so I'll be careful here. I'll write vj belonging to si. It comes somewhere in the order. Take that. Condition on all the things before, right? Then this product is actually the interventional distribution. A very strong claim. Because parents will be in there. See, any distribution can be factorized as P of V blah, conditioned on all the things before. But here the important uh, uh, the important claim here is if you isolate those components corresponding to your SJ and you come up with a product, that is actually the interventional distribution. Of intervening on everything else, and then uh, yeah, so that's the key claim over here. Okay, not obvious, but uh, at least not obvious to me. <laughs> uh, right? Because all you can do is you can you only have this ordering, and you have these conditional distributions, which says uh, some something given everything before in the order. That's always the factorization. What we are saying is take some factors that belong to your C component, group them together, and you form the product. That's actually the interventional. So the left hand side is actually an interventional distribution, but the right hand side is actually purely observation. This all can be computed very easily. Okay. Yes. So is, does that not follow from the fact that the parents are within media means we bracket them? No. No, it's not the complete side. Left hand side is more interesting. This is already interventional, but uh, there's nothing here that says, see, I have marginalized all the use. By the way, the only factorization I know is this. There are use here, marginalized over them. I have no idea why they are factoring in this way. I mean, once I say that, maybe it's intuitive, I don't know, uh, but it requires an induction proof, <laughs> at least the one I am aware of. Okay. So the proof 
Let me attempt to prove it wrong. I'll actually correct it next time. <laughs> no, but yes. I mean, just to, so the interesting aspect is that find that if you find that if I were to write the right hand side for the all of V, of, uh, this is just the standard factorization. The interesting fact is you can only look at Q in isolation and this. Yes. You take those factors which are in your C component, form the product, that's an interventional distribution. <laughs> and simultaneously for each C component. Yeah. So the moment you have a bi-directed edges in a semi-Markovian model, all these things are like implied immediately. Okay. Mostly because the parents uh, and the C components are not conformed. Correct. That's how the thing goes. But still you need to argue why this particular factorization would result. It's not entirely obvious, at least to me. Uh, it's not entirely obvious. Raul, you have a question? So you're considering uh, v, VJ of i as uh, intersection SI, is it? VJ, there is a, okay, take SI, it has a bunch of nodes. Locate them in the ordering. Let's say VJ is in that ordering. So take all those VJs. Then just do a normal factor, P or V or VJ, given all its ancestors. All ancestors in SI or? All ancestors in uh, everything. Right? So when I say VI, it's on the whole map, right? But now the interesting part is this product is the intervention. And it's also equivalent to this marginal range. Right? Okay, the proof I know is what you do is you, you assume simply that this, is, this holds for all graphs on N nodes. Okay. That's the induction hypothesis. I will try to prove it for n plus one. Yeah. Because you know it to be true, then uh, this is an easy cop out. Yes. But pj uh, p of vj given p uh, bracket g minus one is equal to p of vj given uh, parents of vj. That's the other pair. Yes. But uh, it's not exactly parents, uh, so there's some complication there. You have to take the C component of VJ in GVI, VJ actually. You have to take a graph which is induced only by all the things before in the order. Then take the C component of VJ in that and uh, basically look at the parents of all the nodes. Then you have to put it in here. So it's not just parents of VJ. That won't work. That won't work. That won't work. That won't work. Because it this is like the right hand side is observation distribution, but with loose marginalized yeah, Exactly. So there's a complicated marginalization that's happening, uh, but uh, the proof is uh, very interesting. So for one node, you agree that this is a factorization, right? There's nothing to factorize over here. There's only one component. There's no bi-directed edge. P of bi, like this simple. Now, let's say it holds for n nodes, right? Now, if you include one more node, Obviously, it results in a new. So there's another graph of n plus one nodes. So what I do is I take uh, the C component to be S1, uh, let's say SK, and then let's call it S prime. This S prime actually includes the node Vn plus one. Okay. The new, uh, the, the n plus one node that you introduce, uh, that's an S prime. Okay. I think without loss of generality, you can assume that this is the last in the order also. That's fine. What is S1 to SK? Uh, they are other C components. So S1 S to SK and S prime are the C components of this graph. S prime is a special one because it involves V and plus one, the last one. Okay. Just to be very safe, I will actually assume V n plus one. The last guy in the order. I can do that. I just took a graph of n plus one nodes. I ordered them according to the graph, whatever that may be, and I took that C component where the last day it belongs. That's all. Right? Nothing complicated. Okay. So now the argument is you actually marginalize with respect to V1. Once I
think that this complication of the uh, unobserved views or like this bidirectate is sort of tackled by like in the density of the graph. Exactly. That's why uh, in many of the results, uh, they assume that uh, the C component size is not too much or some density of uh, bidirected edges impinging on any node is bounded, then you can actually get very powerful results, right? Uh, so now consider P of Vn. Vn means uh, all the nodes except the n plus one, but joint distribution. So all you have to do is just marginalize with respect to Vn. Right, obviously that's what you would do. Right, so now you actually uh, can write the following. Uh, no. So let me actually start with the original one. By the way, the factorization theorem I proved already. All I have to show is that each one of the factors can be computed by observation. That's the only claim that I made. Yeah. So P of B can be factorized as, uh, let's call it QS prime, QS prime, then product uh, over SJ, QSJ. The C component marginalizations. This is always true. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do marginalized version of P of Vn. Vn plus one is only here. It's not anywhere else, right? So when I marginalize because of the product form, you will actually marginalize over Q of S prime times the product of SJ, QSJ. But I told you that uh, P of Vn factorizes also into C components. Further, S1, SK are C components in B also, Vn also, because we remove Vn plus one. The bidirected edges between the N nodes don't change. If I remove the last node, the bidirected edges between the first N nodes don't change. So with respect to that, these are still C components. Indeed, right? So I don't know about this factor, but I know all these are identified. So from the induction, so induction on N nodes, each Q of Fj is identifiable and it is exactly equal to P of uh, like, uh, so the, the nodes that are there. By the way, I chopped off the n plus one nodes. I'm only considering the internal n nodes essentially. So you will get the product of uh, Bj in S, Bi in Sj, P of Bi, condition on Bi minus. This is by induction, but only for these I've applied. Now you go back here. Q S prime is nothing but P of V divided by all these guys. Right? Product of uh, S J Q S J. By the way, this product doesn't include F prime. So that's there, that's here. So what is P of V? You can always factorize P of V in the normal factorization. Is V V S or no V N plus one? Sorry. So now you can actually factorize this as a uh, product over P of VI given PI minus one. All the factors are there. I runs from one to N plus one are there. Now you remove some factors, right? You remove all the factors that are corresponding to every node in other C components, right? So you basically do uh, the I in SJ, P of B I given B I minus one product over SJ also, right? By the way, C components are partitions of the nodes and there is one factor for every node. The only factors that will remain are the factors in S prime, right? Because of the induction thing, right? So now, uh, that implies that Q of S prime is nothing but the product over VIs that are in S prime only. It could, it does definitely has N plus one, but it also may have some other nodes and I don't care about it. 
correct? Because I don't know how many nodes are here. I have no idea, but it doesn't matter. I only said the other C components are factorizable this way because that's a property of n node graph. Okay. So now the thing is, vi belongs to s prime, and uh, you essentially have p of vi given vi minus. Okay, I mean, you just have to know that this is true and then you can write it, right? Okay, so here I have P of Bn that factorizes into these Q factors, but I have not said all of them are identifiable yet. Now I marginalize with respect to Vn. My claim is that only this term marginalizes into some other term and I don't care about it, but there is a product of all these QSJs. But these SJs are also C components in a graph of size n. And I, I invoke the induction hypothesis that on n node graphs, all the Q, uh, all the factors are actually identifiable. I don't know about this factor, but what I do know is all these factors are C component factors, each one of which is identifiable. Therefore, that must include VI given VI minus one. By the way, this cannot have n plus one because by definition, n plus one is sitting in some other C component. So it only includes n nodes, right? So the induction hypothesis says that all these are individually identified by these factors. Now I go back to here. Qs prime, the one factor that I don't know about, is P of Vn divided by all, uh, all these things. Now P of Vn plus one is actually factorizing this way. This factorization is universally true. I can always take one node and condition on all the things that came before, next node, condition on all the things that came before. Now in this, remove all the things that belong to the C components because they are already from here. They are destroyed, right? No, they are the same, right? Because uh, uh, this is the I'm working on the same graph of n plus one nodes. I'm marginalizing. I'm talking about this Vn, which is marginalized from this graph. And the induction hypothesis on any n node graph, this is false. This is true. So the induction hypothesis is very complicated. When all n node graphs satisfy induction hypothesis, therefore this graph marginalized satisfy the induction hypothesis. Therefore, you have these uh, factors. Cancelling what's left. Whatever is left is left. Okay. It feels like you have never ever used anything about bidirected edges in an explicit manner, uh, but it's very powerful. I'm saying you get all your C components factored this way. The last one. Last one has to factor. That's true. So it isn't cheating that uh, but yeah, you're right. Like, one has to know this before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah otherwise it's not very easy. Sorry, where did the second sum come from? Second. Second one. Yeah. Marginal. So this is over n plus one variables. This is a distribution over n variables. So you marginalize over the n plus one. But this is a product form. All other products do not involve n plus one because by assumption. Because Vn plus one is only in S prime and it is a partition. Therefore, you only marginalize over this. No, not clear. Marginalize over only. Uh, okay, yeah. Right. Why is he not saying sum over uh, v n plus one of uh, everything? Of yes, everything. But they are products. Some parts of the product don't involve v n plus one, so they can be taken out. So, so why are you saying q s prime rather than? Uh, from my understanding of marginalization, you would just use p of uh, v n plus. Correct, but Q S prime has some complicated dependence on V N plus one. It's just a it's just a multiplication, it's just factors. Forget about even probabilities. I just have to marginalize this probability density. I know this is a density function. I just have to marginalize with respect to V N plus one. These factors don't depend on V N plus one. That's all I've said. I've not used anything. Okay, so there's a uh, second part of the theorem. The second part of the theorem is I won't prove it. Uh, this is also equal to this is uh, the second part. You can read uh, Tian's. Uh, this is a deseparation state. You will understand what 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 C component means. Is in, it is immediate. Okay. So now it turns out that this product it includes the parents. Of the C, uh, let me just define what this is. So uh, this is PA of PI. Okay, PI is the C component 
of uh, let's call it case right? I'm trying to be consistent. T I T J is the C component of T J in the graph G V J. It's a mouthful. All I'm saying is, uh, whenever you're considering this guy, uh, take only that node and all nodes before, then look at the C components implied by the subgraph, induced subgraph. In that, there will be some bunch of nodes that are connected to VJ. Right. Uh, take those parents in the graph. Right. All of them must be conditioned. That's all it is. Union DJ. Uh, yeah, so union DJ. Actually, parents of TJ is defined as uh, parents plus J. Yeah, but, but yeah, you are. So I look at the voltage DJ. I look at the graph, which is uh, all sort of in the order from V1 to J. And uh, take TJ to be the C component of BJ in that graph. Okay. Well, there may be some double arrows disappearing. Yeah. Right. Then what you do is uh, take all those, uh, all the parents of those nodes, okay. including BJ actually. Uh, then you can discard. Right. Of course, you drop BJ. I mean, you don't uh, all, all all the other. Actually, let me be very clear. Union TJ. Without VJ. Wow. Oh. Now, how do you prove that the D separation state? You looked at all the things in the order. Here I'm saying there's some very crazy subset I use in the order. Uh, you convince yourself by this definition that it's a D separation state. You can, it's a homework exercise. You just have to think about double arrows, what got cut, what didn't get cut, or that could not be possible, all that. And finally, you can argue that this. <laughs> So it doesn't depend on the parents. It actually depends on the C component in G of VJ, where VJ is included, and all those nodes that come along with it, they'll all be before the order, but they form a C component. Uh, and then you you only take the parents of those. If you have a forward bidirected edge, that doesn't matter. That's all we say. It's not obvious, but. Uh, Yeah, if you have small C component and the number of in degree is small, this kind of says that you have a coordinate factorization, which is again total low of the sparsity. Yeah, but this already is uh, very powerful. Because you can calculate. So you just have to condition on everything. Here it's saying you don't have to condition on everything. You have to see Yeah, so I haven't told you why I came to this. <laughs> uh, from next time onwards, we will use this and start deriving more identifiability. It's a very powerful framework. So already I showed that certain interventional distributions are identified. So far that I've said, now it implies a bunch of other things. Uh, we will slowly get there. And then we show that whatever this can't identify, essentially it's just not identifiable at all. So that's a beautiful part of the By the way, I think that this property holds for any partition. And uh, if the induction hypothesis holds, and I think this is always true. I mean, because I haven't used anything really that uh, that says anything about C components, except the fact that it's a partition. So you must have a way of partitioning, which is consistent uh, with the fact that when you marginalize, these things again, are sub partitions of the original partition. So if the definition of your partition satisfies that recursive property, then this is always true. What is the recursive? Uh, because here you have n plus one nodes. I have a partition. Now when I partition, when I, when I and it's based on the ordering, obviously. Now when I take only n nodes and I consider consider this definition of a partition, it must include S1 till SK. So, 
that recursion, that nested recursion is all that is required. And the moment you have an equivalence class like that, you can always write uh, whatever this uh, factors as this. I mean, if P of V factorizes this way, this will all be true automatically. So it's a more general result. I haven't seen anybody use that property before, but maybe there's something here. It turns out that in C components, if you delete some nodes, the rest of them will still remain as C components in the order. That's a key property. Yes, 